Good afternoon, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. And I have the pleasure of introducing two people known for their creative genius, who will talk to each other and with us about the creative class. Deborah Border is the Hauser Leader in Residence at the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. She is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, where she is hailed for dynamic, far-sighted leadership. Her vision and management have restored and enriched the Philharmonic's artistic and fiscal health, building and enhancing its performance venues, and creating and expanding artistic and community outreach programs particularly programs for youth that create social change through music. Prior to leading the a LA Phil, as it is called, Deborah served for 10 years as executive director of the New York Philharmonic. She also held leadership positions at the San Francisco Symphony, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, and the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Among the many projects Border oversaw in Los Angeles was the opening of the Walt Disney Concert Hall designed by a person who has been called the most important architect of our time, Frank Gehry. <laughs> a Canadian-born Californian, uh, Mr. Gehry was a truck driver, worked as a radio announcer, and tried his hand at chemical engineering and really didn't like it. <laughs> then he turned to the study, finally, of what he loved, art and architecture, and we are so grateful that he did. Mr. Gary earned his bachelor's in architecture from USC, served in the US Army, studied city planning at Harvard's Graduate School of Design before beginning his career in Los Angeles, and all the rest is really modern architecture history. From the Guggenheim Museum, Museum in Bilbao, which the legendary architect Philip Johnson called the greatest building of our time, to the Louis Vuitton Modern Art Museum that opened in Paris last year, to MIT Status Center here in Cambridge, buildings by Frank Gehry amaze, astound, and delight people around the globe. Now, it would take too long for us, we just don't really have that time, to <laughs> list all of the awards that he has won. But among them, I counted 16 honorary doctorates, including one from Harvard. But I do want to quote from the citation of the jury that awarded Mr. Gary the prestigious Prisker um, Architecture Prize. It said in part, and I quote, always open to experimentation, he has a sureness and a maturity that resist in the same way that Picasso did, being bound either by critical acceptance or his successes. Although the prize is for a lifetime of achievement, the jury hopes Mr. Gary will view it as encouragement for continuing an extraordinary work in progress. Welcome, Deborah Borda, our moderator for the evening, and of course, the exceptional Frank Gary. Good afternoon, early evening, whatever we call this uh, time of day. And uh, welcome, Frank. This is great to be reunited here on the East yeah. Coast. Come Let's home soon, please. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> I'm glad to hear, by the way, that the citation said you were mature. That was very good. Um, here's Mar marginally mature. Good. We'll work at it. Yeah. Uh, here's a man who, as Maggie said, has really almost single-handedly uh, transformed the world of contemporary architecture. But he's done it through artistry, technology, resilience, and something people don't always think about, but which is a critical factor about Frank, and that is humanity. Hmm. So we talked about how to start this, and we thought actually we would begin with a, a brief video, which is actually Frank speaking to the 30-year-old Frank and giving him some advice, which he notes you will see in typical Frank fashion, he would not have followed. So here we go. It's a brief video called Note to Self from Frank Gehry.
introduce you to architecture and open up the world to you, you'll find the profession that makes sense to you and gives you a sense of personal pride. You'll be tested again and again. They'll have a teacher tell you that this ain't for you, friend. Find another profession. Man, skip this car. Keep going. And God has proven wrong. Once you find your passion for architecture, work your tail off to understand and build expertise on every facet of your profession. No matter what you do, however big or small, make it the best thing that you can because you'll be judged on everything you do. Make sure everything you design and build adheres to your highest standards. Push back on people who try to dilute this mission and partner with people who support the best. Take every crisis as an opportunity to do better work. And finally, create buildings and places that engage people. It doesn't mean pandering to historical models of the past. Question everything. Be curious forever, and never forget that life is about people. So make buildings for people. And always use natural light, because it's free. <laughs> that, that is so frank. When I, when I first saw it, I thought, well, we can all just go home now because that's the most beautiful introduction. Tell us so much about you. But we'll go in a little bit deeper now, try to find out more about Frank. It, it seems in, in thinking about these, these different things that there's a sort of light motif that, that emerges in your personal narrative. And it's a perception of Frank, Frank Geary as an, as an outsider. As an outsider, um, a Jewish kid who, who feels the sting of anti-Semitism, loving parents, but who always, and I know this from you, ex express a, a subtle sense of disappointment, a teacher who tells you, don't be an architect, uh, and being a California architect before it's as fashionable right. as it is now. So these are crucibles along the path of pretty exciting life. Well, what, California. Uh, you could hide out, you know. At the same time, the architects my age in New York were a, a band together, and they were very close to each other. And Eisenman, Meyer, Graves, all those guys. And so they saw each other regularly. And nobody paid any attention to me on the West Coast. So you could do stuff. And they were always shocked when something <laughs> came up. But um, it was nice being under the radar. It really was. But being under the radar was one part of it. So many different challenges along the way. I mean, for example, in your hometown where you build the masterpiece of a concert hall. For you. Thank you. <laughs> I was a very good client, I hope. Um, but 17 years from the idea to the day when it opens in October of 2003. That was you an odyssey, yes but constantly overcoming? Well, it, the first go around that shot it down uh, was the board. There's always people on the board of, of, of uh, cultural institutions that are builders or have experience building stuff. And they're really a pain in the ass because <laughs> They know everything, they know how everything is right, and they know better than everybody else. And so, uh, and I was, I had a small office at the time of about 50 people, which was enough to do the project, but uh, it wasn't trusted. So they brought in an executive architect, and that's, that's normal, but they paid more attention to, him than to me, and he failed, and I saw him fail. 
and I mentioned it at every meeting, <laughs> and it's in every note that was taken at every weekly meeting, and nobody paid attention to it. And so they started construction with drawings that were incomplete, and they ordered steel and it was delivered. There was, they didn't know where to put it. They didn't have the, the going on. So it failed, 60 million bucks, 60, 70 million bucks down the tubes. Uh, and I was blamed for it. So in a you sense- You weren't there this, yet. <laughs> no, I hadn't quite <laughs> arrived. Could have saved me. <laughs> so that was tough for me because uh, you know, you go out to dinner at a restaurant and inevitably there was somebody from the Philharmonic or something, they'd, they'd come over and say, how could you do that? How could you? You know, our big chance to get a concert hall, you screwed it up, how could you do that? Until the point that I was gonna move, I, I actually- To the East Coast. Yeah, I was gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna go anywhere. <laughs> and uh, there was a, a bit of a hiatus and the, Board hired uh, Jerry Hines, a big developer from Texas who's done a lot of, lot of buildings around the world. And Jerry's company did an, a week, an analysis of what happened. And a big Texan guy, John Harris, huge guy, you know, came to my office a week later and I, I was scared <laughs> what he was gonna do, what he was gonna say. And he grabbed my hand and he said, Mr. Gary, you've been effed. <laughs> you know, I would have said it the other way, but yeah. <laughs> I, I was on a radio program yesterday and I said shit and they bleeped me. I don't know, they might bleep you here. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. So I'm in very it, sensitive. Yeah. You know. <laughs> in, in, it's, I think you've just seen a demonstration of something, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask your opinion about it. In his, in his new book, Paul Goldberger um, characterizes you as having, and there's sort of quotes around it, an aw shucks, aw shucks persona, which he says masks a profound drive. Do you, do you think that's an accurate uh, observation? Probably, probably. I try to hide. Because you know, I, I, I work with what I call a healthy insecurity. So uh, every project is, I don't know what I'm gonna do. It's, if I knew what I'm gonna do, I wouldn't do it. And so I'm approaching it like sort of looking what, what's coming next and trusting that, but worried about it. And so I, if you get me during that period, I'm kind of under the radar, you know, hiding. And I, and I go through that a lot. I once heard you say it's easier to deal with failure than success. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I forget why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move into technology in that case. <laughs> you know, your design, so many of your designs were built when people said they, they simply couldn't be. Did the technology exist or did you have to invent it? Well, the, the technology I used existed, but it was used for airplanes. The French uh, aircraft industry was using it. And uh, it How was- How did you discover that? It was very, com well, I was having trouble doing a curved shape. Back up a little. Why was I using curved shape? I was trying to find a way to express feeling with inert materials like this is highfalutin, like the Greeks did, where you f if you look at the Elgin marbles, you feel the pressure of the warrior's shields into the stone. You feel it. How did they do that? How did they transmit that? sense of feeling over the centuries you know and and i was looking for a way to express motion i thought we lived in a world of planes everything moving and instead of copying out to 19th century decoration which you know which is great i mean the good thing about 19th century decoration for a lot of buildings is that at least it's friendly compared to those faceless things that get built. 
so I'm, but you can't do that, especially at Harvard, you can't do that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> where they do a lot of it, right? <laughs> I mean the 19th century buildings. Um, I think uh, in searching for something to do that, I called uh, IB IBM, because they had the best software at the time, and, and they sent us to Dassault in France, and I met with the Dassault people, and they, they gave us some of the, their, their tricks, some of the things they were doing. And I tried it on, uh, I did a big fish sculpture in Barcelona at the hotel. And it was made by an Italian uh, company, Permis de Lisa. And we'd sent them CAD drawings and they couldn't, couldn't build it from a two-dimensional drawing. And so when I sent, when I sent them the Katia program from, with the drawings from Katia, I got a call from the boss of the Italian company. Perfecto. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then we used it on Bilbao where there's no two pieces of steel the same size. And we got very tight bids. When you put buildings out to bids with two-dimensional drawings, there's a lot left, a lot of poss possibility for misinterpretation. And so bidders of varying people bid it with their own ways, ways of protection. So the bids come in all over the place. Uh, we had six bidders bidding on the steel they were all 18% under budget and the spread was 1%. That means the documents are really tight. There's no, no mistakes. There's all, and they built it for that. And we could pick any one of them. And that's when I realized we were heading into a new world and, and it was gonna be powerful. And I started talking to the insurance companies about risk management. I, I went all over the place trying to talk to the building departments about um, uh, uh, having projects uh, approved with the software, the 3D. Uh, we ran into that trouble there because they couldn't use a proprietary software. They had to have every, and in the last couple of years, we developed a translator software that you can use any software. But by now, the building departments have bought third, not as good stuff and they're committed so you can't get in yet but eventually you'll be able to get a, a building approved with a, within a couple of weeks which now takes six months somehow. but to start this back in the 90s was a real fusion and creative moment of, yeah. of technology and artistry now in so but yeah, just sorry, sure. the the tower in new york which has curvy walls and the curvy walls are, are bay windows, so they're not decoration. And we built that with no change orders, yeah. the curtain wall. So that saves a lot of money. So there's a lot of money to be saved, and I really believe in that. I really be believe you don't have to spend a lot of money to build good buildings. You can build them within reasonable budgets. So. So in 1997, one of your first curvy buildings opens, Bilbao, and uh, Herbert Mouchamp. 300 bucks a square foot. Which is amazing. And Herbert Mouchamp, who we miss very much, um, wrote at that time, um, if you want to see the heart of American art today, you are going to need a passport. So much has been written about the museum. It's there now almost two decades later. What are your feelings now about the museum and specifically about a term that, of course, has been introduced since then that is studied all around the country, which is the Bilbao effect? Hmm. Well, that's better than Starkitect. <laughs> <laughs> We're not using that word today. <laughs> the, the press in, invents these terms and then they use them against you. It's crazy. I, I don't think Bilbao effect was against you. No, 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 no. The Bilbao effect is is real, $3.5 billion in revenue to the city. 
That's a pretty good effect for a 300 buck a square foot building. What was, what was Bill Bell like when you first went there? I, I've been there recently, but I have a feeling yeah, it was very, very different. Very dead, very uh, sad. Uh, kids got out of high school and left immediately. The ship in, shipping industry was dead. Uh, the steel industry was dead. Uh, the brick factories were dying. All, of, all the industry was, was in a decline. It was pretty sad, and when I got there and started showing these models, uh, a thing came out in the newspaper, kill the American architect. Well, they did bomb the opening, didn't they? Yeah, <laughs> they were after the king. Then, That's but right. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, but it was, you know, they were so desperate, they didn't want a, anything. They, they thought this was a waste of money and time. Today, I could live there for free. <laughs> and why I don't go there would be a beautiful life to live there. Uh, I like the wine. I like the people. I don't understand the language, but uh, it's, uh, it's a different city. It's got a real smile on its face. Uh, if I walk down the street, I get hugged and blessed and kissed and everything. But I should say it's the same thing. If you're ever lucky enough to go into a concert in Walt Disney Concert Hall with Frank Gehry, it's like a little Elvis moment. Everybody rushes up and wants autographs and, and appreciates so much the work you've done. But speaking of appreciation. Um, but not the first two years, remember? No, but later on. No, but the first two years, I used to sit next to Deborah. And I would say, Deborah, that light over there is too bright. <laughs> or why is the guy doing that? And so then she moved my seat. <laughs> <laughs> I had to earn my way back in. We sit together again now. Uh, <laughs> well, it was pretty difficult, it's true. <laughs> you were. Uh, when I was your client, you were great. But later on, it was harder. Um, <laughs> Okay, so th thinking of Bill Ballin, thinking of Walt Disney Concert Hall, can, can an architect or an artist with a high aesthetic ambition as yours, can they also be, because it seems to happen, embraced by the public, so can one be avant-garde and be popular? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it depends, I think. Uh, some buildings are not revered for a long time, but uh, I don't know. I'm doing okay. <laughs> that was sort of my point, but okay. <laughs> um, well, something about Frank. Um, but there's a lot of misconception about, about I mean, if, if, I were, if this was a room full of uh, business guys that I, every once in a while I, forget and, get and agree to give a talk to. I always say, how many people in this audience think my work is expensive? And everybody gets up. How many people here think I'm a prima donna? Everybody gets up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I mean, people have perceptions. And uh, when I did Bill, after I did Bill Bow, it took like 15 years, I think, before I got a museum to do it. In that same period, my friend Renzo Piano did 24. <laughs> so he was like better, you know, that it's, 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 a, it's just a different, different culture, different. Perception of being an outsider and an underdog for right. a lot of your life. Yeah. Well, speaking about a place where you're absolutely not either of those things. Um, something that I know about Frank from personal experience to be really true is that he's incredibly energetic and generous in forming really deep and lasting relationships. Um, but it's interesting because your closest friends are artists, visual artists, and especially um, musicians very close to um, Daniel Barenboim, Gustavo Dudamel, Esapeka Solonen, Simon Rattle. And in fact, 
he's a terrific musician. He has great ears. I can sit with him at concerts, and I'm a trained musician. You hear things I don't hear. And of course, we've even pro planned programs together. But um, I what just found out I need a hearing aid. You better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can still be a good musician. <laughs> what makes you hang out with these kinds of guys? Well, years ago, well, I guess it started with my mother taking me to concert. But years ago, I, I, I was curious about Japan. It, if you grew up in LA architecturally or as an artist, it was very Asia-centric. And um, the architects that were a generation ahead of me were, it, it was the track building thing. So hundreds of tract houses, you'd come to LA and they were just spread all over the place. And it was wood, wood two by fours. And it was kind of beautiful before they put all the skin on it. But I think uh, that was, that made the Japanese model of, of um, wood buildings very seductive because it was easily assimilated and it was much more exciting. And so a lot of uh, my teachers were doing that. And uh, it, I was very, as a young student, I bought into it. I got very excited about it. And, and you even studied Japanese music, didn't you? Yeah, so I studied the literature and the art and as much as I could about it. And I got into the music and there was a, a a gagaku, imperial court music, musician orchestra at UCLA in the Department of Ethnomusicology. And they let me join it. Now, I, I'm not a musician, so the sound of the, the music is <coughs> clink, clink. That's me. I learned to do the clink, clink. <laughs> and they, they, uh, brought a guy from Japan to teach me how to breathe properly, so I did it right. But when you get into Gagaku, there's only 50 compositions, and it's a 1,000 years old. Um, but dance comes with it, and it's visually incredible, and sonically very strange. And, and if you get, you can become addicted to it, which I did, and that when, Pierre Boulez used to come to LA and, and uh, did some of his very, very early compositions and people would walk out on him at, at the then Chandler concert hall. Um, I found this, uh, uh, because of the Gaga coup, I could, I just went into it. You know, I, I really fell in love with his his work and, and then all the stuff that came after it. When I finally met him and mentioned that, he said, I have nothing to do with Kagaku. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't true, actually. Because he I found a, a two pages in a book, one of his books where he talks about Kagaku. Um, so that was an entry, a sonic entry thing for me into where I could get it, you know, visually and sonically, and, and uh, get excited about it. And then LA had, uh, Stravinsky lived in LA at the time, and uh, Schoenberg lived in LA, and so we had access to all these guys, and uh, Stravinsky's balletic music was also visually uh, engaging for me. So I could, I could get into it that way. And then reading his, his, his writings on, on his art, I found so very compelling and, and engaging. And so it was easy for me to fall into that because a lot of architecture was so banal and so hard to get excited about. Every, every, every city looks the same somehow. And people don't complain. Why don't you complain? 
I, you know, there was even a, a piece written about your design and building of Walt Disney Concert Hall, written by Esapekka Salonen called Wing on Wing, in which you are the um, narrator, in a sort of disembodied voice that floats oh, in the background. Oh, God, he really <laughs> suckered me into that one. <laughs> he said, Frank, I need some of your tom timbre of your voice for the pro this thing. Can, would you come to the sound studio and record your voice? And you, it won't be heard. You won't, you won't be, nobody will know it's you or anything at all. It'll be broken <laughs> up. I said, okay. I went, talked for a couple hours. They recorded it. Opening night, there's two coloraturas. Chur Sopranos, yes. Huh? Yes. And all of a sudden I hear, why the fish? <laughs> We, we toured this piece all over Europe and it became a convention of the orchestra when we'd have an acoustic rehearsal, you would hear Frank's voice and he would say, why the fish? And the orchestra en masse would say, where's the beef? <laughs> <laughs> every, every rehearsal. Let's, let's move to another question, just two more and then we're gonna open it up uh, for the folks here. Uh, you know, it's fair to say that, I think it's fair to say, I don't know, that one of the most personal expressions of who we are is our home, where we live. But for an architect, as you design a home, the metaphoric symbolism of it is, is much heavier. In 1977, you and Berta bought a little old Dutch colonial house in an unassuming neighborhood in um, Santa Monica, and you transformed it in some very, uh, I would say, unexpected ways. Can you talk to us a little bit about the inspiration and the process, and did the neighbors hassle you? Yes, they did. <laughs> well, I... Uh, I didn't have a lot of money, and I had $50,000 at that time to do a little bit of remodeling. So you couldn't do much. Uh, I, you know, it, it was, I was being opportunistic. There was a, a side yard that I could expand into, and a front yard I could expand into a few feet, and the rear yard I could expand into. And so I decided to put a new house around the old house. Because that's, that's a good description of it. Yeah. The old house is a two-story Dutch gambrel thing. And it had been moved from the ocean, from Ocean Avenue in the turn of the century. And it's the only two-story house. And it sort of had an iconic presence. So I wanted, this is how I think anyway, I wanted the to preserve the iconic presence of the two, not to lose it for the neighbors. And so I built this new house around it and I uh, played off it and composed windows and stuff with it. And because I didn't have much money, I used corrugated metal. And because I was interested in the denialism uh, that was prevalent, which still is, uh, I was looking for a metaphor for that and, and trying to understand it. And so I sought out the most despised material universally was chain link fence. So I thought, great, I'll play with chain link fence and find out where the edge is, where you can, where people will accept it. Because they, they're built, they're using it all over the world. They're knitting mills making, they still are and people hate it. So I thought, that's a good <laughs> research to do. <laughs> so I'm standing outside my house, the neighbor from across the street comes over, looks at me and says, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what's the matter? He said, well, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's I don't understand it, I don't like it. So I said, you live over there? He said, yeah. I said, you've got two trailers in your backyard. You've got a chain link fence around those. In your front yard, you have a, a wreck of a car up on, on blocks. And I said, I'm not complaining about your aesthetic. Why are you, what makes you think you, you know? He said, well, mine is, is normal. 
the story of all of our lives. <laughs> but then to the chain link thing, uh, I had a lawyer friend who, who used to make fun of me about chain link. Called, he introduced me to people as the chain link guy. And so he bought a house, a fancy house in Brentwood or somewhere. And he needed some remodeling, and he had another architect do it, and he was running into trouble. He asked me to come over and look at it. And from his kitchen window, his dining room window, his bedroom window, his living room window, every room in the house, he looked out into a garden in which there was a tennis court with a chain link fence <laughs> around it, right? So I said, hey, Mickey, I'm embarrassed. I've converted you to this infernal material. He said, what are you talking about? I said, every room in your house looks at a chain link fence. He said, that's a tennis court. <laughs> so it's the symbol of wealth. It, it worked OK, right? It's, it's, it's kind of strange. <laughs> but that, that's, that disconnect is pervasive, I think, in, in a, lot of, a lot of other instances where we accept things because they're, they're sort of normal. They become normalized in, in our society, and we accept them without thinking about it. Well, your house seems normal to me. <laughs> well, now. <laughs> One last question, and then we'll open it up. Um, and this is, this is a question during these, these classes, the creative classes, we call it, where we've been speaking to really some of the most creative people in America. And so as an artist, as a citizen, um, you've got to be concerned about the increasing marginalization of the discussion from the, or actually the absence from our central discourse of any discussion of the arts, of all types of arts. And we have here, here at Harvard, preparing future leaders of the world, so I thought maybe we could um, end up with this. What advice would you give to them about the importance of art, not only in their own lives, because I do think it's very important for people to think about art in their own lives, but also the absence of art, of what art means when it, when it is not there as it should be to make a truly <coughs> flourishing and healthy society? Well, there's a lot of different aspects to it, but um, I think that most pe people don't realize that that art, you know artists it, you accept that artists act intuitively and you know they stand in front of the canvas and they do something. Uh, but I think that the most serious and successful business people are also act intuitively. They don't quite realize that they're in a sense artists. It's a very similar. Uh, and I think they would be, people would be enriched by understanding that it's okay to be intuitive, because you're doing it, and to recognize that. Um, I'm on a program now that, that uh, is bringing arts education to elementary schools that where 50% of the kids in the elementary school don't graduate. This is a program started by Michelle Obama on the East Coast. And, and uh, we've started in, in California. We've got 10 schools. And we bring an arts educator to the classroom. And it just it works like a charm. It opens these kids up. They, get, they start making things with their hands. Uh, I did a program where we had them build a city. And so I gave them a bunch of blocks and, and cardboard boxes, and they tore them up and made, anyway, fast forward, they made these things and painted them, and they got invested with it. Kids, kids that were normally not interested in anything, you couldn't, I mean, if you tried to talk to them, they wouldn't even look at you. Uh, and all of a sudden, they're making this thing. They built the city, and I said, you know, we have to calculate the area of this. Oh, we do? I said, yes. And so I taught them how to do, calculate the area. And I was teaching math in a nanosecond. And they were open to it. And then 
I s talked about who runs the city, the government. You could talk about civics, and you know, you could get into literature and art and everything. I think it's a, it's a, for, I can't believe everybody is, doesn't have part of it, something of it in their lives because it's very, uh, I mean, everybody reads literature and stuff. So. To listen to music, doesn't everybody listen to music? I don't know. <sighs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> um, now people can, we have four microphones around here and um, just three sort of ground rules. Number one, please introduce yourself. Next, please limit yourself to a single question. And most important, remember to end whatever it is with a question mark. Okay, sir. Uh, my name is Ben Bolger, and I'm an alumnus of the uh, Harvard Design School. And I um, have a question about uh, good design. Uh, so a lot of examples would say the Vietnam War Memorial, uh, the uh, Eiffel Tower in Paris, where the designs were not always immediately embraced by the public. So there's a hurry for the designer to still create the most creative. What is a productive way for design experts to work with the public to get them to embrace concepts? Oh God! <laughs> I th I think what what did I do? Just your glasses. Uh, I think respecting the people is uh, is the most important thing. Is to not talk down to people. Um, to include them, it's it's easy to engage people when you do that. Um, and I think there are, I, I mean, when I finish a building in Bilbao, they wanted to kill me. But uh, they advertised in the paper, kill the American architect. But after a while, they realized that it was doing them some good and it was uh, changing their economy. And so they came around to it when they see the benefits of it. But, uh, I think the a precarious thing is for the general public would be to look at the Stata Center we did. That it it probably isn't easy for somebody to say, "Gee, that's great." But if you talk to the people that use it, they were in on it with me. I went. We opened the website. I think it was called when we started. And every Friday we posted pictures of the models and drawings as we were going. And the first year I got a lot of hate mail, but slowly they began to understand this is a serious endeavor. This is trying to do something for them. And they, par they became partners in it. And it was, so what is there is a collaborative effort with them. And I, I walked through, through the, Infin infinite corridors, or whatever they call it. A couple of years ago, they didn't know I was coming, and there was a big sign that said, Frank Gary, we love you. So I just made some friends, I guess. But, uh, I think if, if it's an honest effort, if it's not a, a kind of a vanity building, a lot of my brethren are all about themselves, maybe. Uh, and you can tell that you people aren't stupid; they get it. So, I think if you legitimately open the door to a, a, a discussion, um, at first they may want to kill you, but eventually they like you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Over here. Hi, my name is uh, Philip Geisler. I'm an international student uh, here at Harvard for the fall term. Um, and I'm studying history of art and architecture, both at the Department for the History of Art and Architecture and at the GSD. Um, and I would like to come back to a notion that uh, Mrs. Borda brought up in her introduction, with, which is the notion of the humane. Um, I've been thinking about that for a while uh, over the past months here. Um, and I would like to ask you what um, about this relationship of humanism and architecture, or also urban design, and what you think today, I mean, this 
this question has been discussed in history so often, but um, what you think today is a humane architecture and humane space and how it relates to um, notions of democracy, equity, liberty, but also capitalism. Oh, yeah, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> 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 Can we meet after? Or <laughs> I would love to. I mean, <laughs> <that's> fine. <laughs> um, well, I suppose my own tendencies tend to be on the uh, not socialist, but I'm on the more liberal side about architecture, about the work. I mean, politics. I go all over the place, but um, I think. Uh, That, that if, uh, that's what I was saying, if you respect people and you respect that people are gonna use these spaces, you make stuff for them. But you always have, a, what people forget when they look at a building, they forget there was a client involved. There are other forces. Uh, and in my case, the client is pretty involved. I get them pretty involved. So by the time the building is, is finished, it does represent their wishes and their, their visions and, and as, as to what, but not architecturally. I, I try to, to use my language to respect their language and their needs. Uh, so, you know, guys like me are outside the, the realm that gets these huge city projects. You know, we, we get one building at a time, usually. Uh, and so it's very hard to address all those issues mm. with one pishy little building, you know. Uh, I think people are worried a lot about streets, streetscape. Uh, uh, Jane Jacobs talked about that a long time ago. Uh, and a lot of the buildings, uh, I used to take walks through Boston, the old section that's been torn down to build Charles River Park. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit I worked on Charles River Park. <laughs> but it wasn't, I was working for another office, so I, I didn't have any, I was just learning. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think those notions are still around and, and uh, people talk about them and, and uh, the New York Planning Department uh, does talk about that, mm -hmm. about the street wall and the adding, having people on not blank walls, but, but there's a, you know, there's a, it's a big, Deal. The old, uh, the planning, the urban planning, the, the bigger scale stuff is usually done, not done by uh, very talented people. I haven't seen, I mean, I think Olmsted was the last person that. <laughs> <laughs> Up here, yeah. um, Mr. Gary, so I'm a, a student from the Graduate School of Design, and I was wondering, one of the qualities for architects, especially in the Californian context, is the earthquakes, especially in comparison, contrast to the East Coast. So I was wondering, has this affected you? Do you think about this in your design, and has this affected your design, and perhaps distinguish your work from your East Coast peers? I guess you're saying my buildings look like that. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, is, is there a specific, do you think the earthquake context has prompted you to think more about structure or more consciously about structure, which has allowed you to perhaps gain a, another degree of freedom, which wasn't available to, to your, your contemporaries? No, I don't think any of that applies. I don't, it's just, uh, it's engineering. It's, um, uh, there are criteria, engineering criteria, codes that you have to match. I don't express earthquake in my buildings, I don't think. <laughs> I, I was in a, an earthquake in the building. We made a video of it. Charles Dutrois was conducting and 
when an earthquake comes, as you know, you hear it first, and then you start feeling it. And uh, the audience sort of gave a little scream, and the orchestra just kept right on playing, and everything was fine. So I think it was earthquake proof. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> Hi, I'm a student at the business school, and um, I w there's many things that are said about our generation, the millennials. Many are good, many are bad. Um, but I was curious to know how, how is our generation and our dynamics and our future needs, and especially a sharing economy, the Airbnbs, Ubers, in the next few years, the self-driving cars, how is that impacting the way you think about design and architecture? I don't have a self-driving car yet, but <laughs> um, I think... <laughs> I've been working with uh, Mark Zuckerberg on his campus, and and that's un unusual and interesting. Uh, a guy with a you know obviously has a, a direction and he knows what he's doing, and architecture is not a, a capital A thing in his life. He just wants a building that speaks to um, not a finished idea. I think it's in maybe in counterpoint to the Apple campus, which is looks very finished and every hair in place. And he, I think what he wanted fits with me, that it, it's not a finished thing, that it's a work in, always feels like it's a work in progress. Um, I think the engineering, as I, I talked about earlier, is to, to get the, the work done so precisely that you can build quicker. And so we built his building. I met him one day, and three years later, he, his company moved into the building. That was unheard of speed. And, and when we started the second building, they said they wanted it faster. So I know there's a breaking point here, I guess, somewhere that I will have a nervous breakdown. But <laughs> I, I, so far it's pretty conventional in, in the world around us. The, the response, the the inter, the connectivity of of the cultures is exciting, and uh, I don't really know how to use it myself. Mark put me on Facebook, but I don't know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people wrote me immediately they wanted to be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and that scared me, so I... <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, gee, if I refuse them, they're going to get pissed off. So I just turned the thing off. I don't know, that's up for grabs. We, you have to invent a new world. I hope I'm around for part of it anyway. Thank you, next question. Hi, Mr. Gary. Uh, my name is Priscilla and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and in the past, I've done a bit of work with the American Institute of Architecture and with Frederick Schwartz. And I was just wondering, coming from New York, we have to balance um, a lot of the spirit of the community, um, what do the buildings look like now, and the avant-garde approach. So what is your opinion on our philo the philosophy we should take as to the extent we should balance that, what buildings look like now and what buildings should look like in the future? <laughs> well, we don't know what buildings should look like in the future. We could speculate, I guess, but then um, a lot of people did over the years um, do models and, and proposals for future buildings that eventually became part of the, of the architectural language in some cases. One of the best ones I know is Eric Mendelssohn, who was, um, did the Einstein Tower in Potsdam. If you get a chance to go there, it's a small building, and it's cited. Uh, he, he, he was genius in the way he cited the building. So he, there's old 19th century, uh, what do you call it? Huh? It's just there. 
to phone me. that somebody forgot to turn off. Oh. So there, there are the, these, uh, uh, what do you call those things? Observatory or planetarium kind of thing. Looking at this telescopes. <laughs> uh, and so they got these big round things and they're 19th century building brick with 19th century decoration. And uh, he cited the building. So as you approach, as you come onto the site and approach the building, quite miraculously, you're on exact center line of the Einstein Tower. And it's, I've never experienced anything so powerful and without fanfare. I mean, you, you could miss it, but once you go there, you, you don't miss it. And, and you might not realize it, but you think about it later and say, what, what did I just see? Oh my God. Uh, and the, the imagery of, this, of the movement with these buildings, which were difficult, because he was building them with bricks and mortar, he didn't have the computers that I have. I always say that if he had our computer programs, I wouldn't have, he would have been, he would have done what I'm doing way ahead of time, but would have had been able to do the language that he shows in some of his drawings. So I think there are works that are done at a time that are talk about the future, can't be built in this time because of a bunch of stupid problems maybe, but um, I wouldn't say you have to propose a style. I mean, it, we're all about democracy, so everything goes. So the, the collision of thought is, is represented in, arch in buildings too architecture, different ideas are colliding to make the city. And the only thing I complain about is the quality of the buildings that are made are kind of very ordinary, usual, and repetitive from city to city, so you see the same game going on. Um, but I, I think the 19th century the six and seven story buildings that organized the city of Paris and, and uh, building and uh, Barcelona, and that was the language of that time and it was very successful. It, those, we love going to those cities because it's clear these buildings are background and um, the iconic so-called iconic buildings are the cultural and government centers. And that seems to be tradition from way back, from the Greeks, that, that uh, the courthouse, the library, the music hall, the museum have a, s a reason to have a level of iconic expression because they represent kind of the the image of a city, and that's how that, from, you go from city to city and you see these buildings that define, define the old cities. Um, okay, is something? I don't know if I you. answered your question, but <laughs> I Here tried. We go. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Gary, I'm Lily Wu. I'm a first year MBA student at the business school. Um, and I'm wondering if you can touch on your relationships with Tom Kranz, the former director of the Guggenheim Museum, and with Larry Gagosian, who's currently representing you and brought your fish lamp sculptures to, to New York and to Europe in general. And what role do these relationships, if any, um, play in your creative effort or pre creative <laughs> process? Thanks. Uh. Well, Tom Krenz is a, a genius, I think. There's, I agree. There's nothing, not, not a lot like him. Uh, and he also steps on his own show a lot because he gets so far ahead of people. And uh, 
I think the, the Bilbao Museum was a collaboration between us and we could talk, talk to each other. Um, he's, he said that uh, he wanted me to build galleries that were what I wanted, what I thought a gallery should be. And he wanted, for the young artists, for the living artists, and he said he wanted me to build classical galleries that's rectilinear with white walls uh, for the dead artists who couldn't defend themselves, so to speak. And that's worked out, and uh, that notion of, and it was very criticized because they were, there was a lot of criticism that the building was more important than the, than the art. And then since then, a lot of buildings were built. And, I mean, I was really placed on the outside after that. that, uh, that I was told very emphatically that I wouldn't be able to do museums because they were, they were antithetical to the art. That's not what the artists were telling me. The artists didn't want to be in those white, hermetic galleries. They wanted, they were, in fact, those galleries are overpowering to the art, in fact. And minimalism is, a lot of art can't, I mean, I've seen a Jeff Koons' beautiful work in a minimalist gallery and it's totally destroyed by the, the feeling of the gallery. So you gotta be careful that, you know, if you had a garage, an old garage with a wrecked car and a bunch of trunks in it and you put a Picasso up, if you lit it beautifully, it would be fine, you know. <laughs> so I don't, uh, and I've worked with artists over the years enough to know that they aren't that precious about about that, and they don't like it to be precious. They want it to be very matter of fact, and and uh, and they're very outspoken about the galleries they like and don't like. And what was the question? I forgot. You get one question only. So let's take one final question, actually, because I've gotten the signal of the evening's moving along. So thank you. Hi, Mr. Gary. Um, it's an honor to be addressing you. I'm a first year student at the Kennedy School. I have a question about the LA River project. So, um, <laughs> some people have, have written. I hope you have an hour. This is a big <laughs> <laughs> Some people have written that they, they worry that it will become LA's next expensive coastline, uh, that people are already speculating on, on parcels near the river. And I'd, I'd love to hear from you what your aspiration for the role that the river might play in LA going forward and how you deal with uh, various public and private interests in a public space project like that. So uh, Mayor Garcetti, who I didn't know very well, called me to a meeting and asked me if I would take this project on. Now, this was pro bono, so it wasn't, he wasn't gonna pay me. Uh, <clears throat> his reference was that, uh, or the impetus was that the New York built a high line and everybody was all excited about it. We've got this 51 miles of river that should be, get a lot more attention than the high line. And so why couldn't we do something with that? And I looked at him and said, the, High Line is the derelict railroad bridge. You could tear it down, you could plant on it, you could do a lot of things, but it doesn't have a, bit, a cause and effect thing. I said the river is, a, as far as I know, is a flood control project, and as such probably has some requirements that are reflected in the, in the construction of it. And I know people have been playing with it for years and I don't see much progress. So I asked him to, I said if I, I take it on, I'd like to be able to select the consultants that we pick 
and I'd like him to put in neutral the, because a lot of people were working on it and felt like they owned it. And I said, could you talk to them and tell them to just give us a little time. We're not gonna exclude them. If they're talented people, they certainly will participate. And I don't intend to, to do the whole thing. Uh, so we started looking at it from a hydrology. I brought in experts from Holland and, and all over the place that had experience with that. And discovered that uh, we waste a lot of money. We buy water from Colorado and other places. I think 11, 1200 bucks an acre foot we pay. So there's a lot of money spent for Los Angeles and the LA basin. And we, we a uh, billion gallons of water goes down the river into the ocean every year and maybe more. And the amount of money we lose is anywhere from 80 to 200 million. We're still trying to figure out a year. So uh, we've approached it as a trying to find an economic model for it instead of a design model. Because first of all, you got to solve the hydrology. You got to figure out what it needs and what, it, what it, you have to do. Then figure out what the options are to what, what you can do with it. And then you got to find out how to pay for it. How can you, I mean, it's a big deal. And there's 15 cities, it's not just LA. So it's Long Beach and Southgate and Burbank and Glendale and Canoga Park. All these people have a stake in it. And uh, so we've gone to all those cities and met with all those mayors and all those councils and uh, uh, found out that this is the first time that any of them have been consulted about this. And we've created a pretty good constituency of, of, of friends that, that can do stuff. And uh, I even got uh, the governor to look at it. And he gave me two minutes. And I, I was pretty sure he got it. And then he started sending his minions that from that his cabinet and people that are relevant to it and we found that there were a lot of interface with the fast rail line and with other elements uh, in our research we discovered that the social uh, inequities along the river were pretty powerful and needed to be addressed uh, the largest uh, section of, of obesity in LA County is along the river north of city, city Hall. And why is that? And what's going on? And um, so we brought in the medical profession, we brought in uh, public health people, and, and have created a constituency of experts. So I think we're doing it very responsibly. So no, it's not talking about design and you know, taking concrete out or where you plant trees. It's trying to find opportunities for reclamation, uh, uh, financial, regaining finan financially. And it's a big, big number. And then finding places where you can do development, where you can bring in developers and also get revenue from that for these communities and start to then develop uh, strategies for how to, what, what to do with it. When you look, I, I got a map of the whole basin and there's the San Gabriel River. There's a lot of water stuff coming down. And if you look at all these small tributaries as, as they're on the map, and you imagine greening them in some way, making paths out of them, LA would be linked in a way that no other city 
I've seen has. So it could be a, a paradigm shift in what LA is and looks like. Uh, LA has put freeways through neighborhoods and cut, as other, other communities have, cut off uh, different populations from each other. Uh, in downtown LA, the, f the railroad tracks are right next to the Union Station within walking distance of City Hall. And on the other side of, on the other side of those railroad tracks is a whole Latin population that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, if we could do what Chicago did and build over those tracks and build a p some park and connect that part of, of Boyle Heights through to S City Hall and even up to Disney Hall where the, we could create a, a, a kind of a cultural thing of, of uh, the, the linkage would be powerful for the community. And, and Deborah's doing a program called YOLA with Youth Orchestra LA that would be a prime uh, user for this, what we're talking about. And there are many other things like it. So that's just an example of how we're, how we're going about it. It's interesting. Well, everybody, thank you very much. I think what we, what we saw today, Frank, and I hope all of you experienced is the essential Frank Geary, but also learning a little bit about the fact that he is a visionary for our time that goes far beyond being an architect, but you're still a great architect. Frank, so much. Thank you so much for being here. I'll see you in California. <laughs>